So I'm Adrian Hope Bailey. I work at Coil, previously at Ripple. I joined Ripple around about the time when Stefan and Evan had this really cool idea called Web Settlement, which eventually became Interledger. Uh, and I'm also the voice you probably recognize from all the Interledger community calls. So now you, now you know what I look like. Um, so I'm based in Cape Town. Uh, for a very long time, I was working from there on my own. Uh, very recently, um, Don and Matt joined me. Uh, so there's a team of three of us down there. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a product, if you like, or, or, or a piece of software we call Rafiki, um, which is an Interledger connector implementation. It's written in TypeScript. Um, and I'll take you through a bit of a background story, why we built it. Um, how it works, it will, a lot of it will be uh, most interesting to people who have used the existing uh, ILP connector software and, and be able to see the differences. But feel free to interrupt, ask questions, uh, tell us the design sucks, um, although you should try it first. Uh, and, then, um, and then I'm kind of invite you to uh, tell us about what you think we should work on next and uh, become a contributor. So, the origin story. About six months ago, not quite, we started doing some work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, on a project called Modulope, which is a mobile payment switch. And part of what we're doing on that project is, uh, and, and we've been involved for, for some time uh, previously as Ripple and now more recently as Coil, and, and part of that is helping them to figure out how this um, mobile money system um, can be used in cross-border or how they can do cross-currency in-network, uh, effectively solve some of the problems that Interledger solves. So, so we've been involved for a long time applying the concepts and the ideas of Interledger to, uh, to Moduli. And one of the things we needed to do uh, in, in building out a proof of concept for them that we started late last year was give them a routing component that looks like the Interledger connector. Uh, and so we undertook a, a bit of an effort to extract the router from ILP connector. And that turned out to be more painful than extracting all of our own teeth. Uh, so we, we ended up basically pretty much rewriting a routing component uh, that does the same thing, but isn't tightly bound to all of the other pieces of what's in an ILP connector. So anyone who's used ILP connector will know it's got a whole plugin framework and infrastructure and a whole lot of other moving parts and pieces that are all quite tightly coupled together. Uh, and so it was very difficult to extract routing out as a component on its own. And so that, that was kind of the, the thing that started us down this journey. Many whiteboard sessions and design discussions later, we, we had a bunch of ideas about how we could take that and build a, a new Connect implementation around it. And so we had a couple of motivations that, uh, that we were working, that, that were sort of uh, behind a lot of what we did. Firstly, as I said, we had to isolate the router. So that was, that was something we had to do anyway. And then what we thought was, well, you know, I've been doing this for a while, getting on four years. Um, Matt and Don were new to the project and new to ILP. And, and so they had quite interesting, fresh perspectives on what works, what doesn't work, what is really hard to understand, uh, what didn't make sense. So, you know, we've got a long legacy of, um, <coughs> of code that, that's been built up over years and years. But it was interesting to get some fresh views on and, you know, how that stuff was fitting together. Uh, and so then what we decided is, firstly, we wanted to make something that was way more modular. It allowed you to take pieces out, put pieces in, not just plugins, but you know, the other pieces of, of, how, of how the connector works. Um, solve a particular pain point that I had come across in trying to run a connector and that had become a, a big topic amongst anyone around connectors, which was dynamic configuration, being able to change the configuration of the connector as you went. And then the, uh, the, the, the way that you peer between connectors. I mean, we went through that process today. Current peering is hard and that's a lot of work from Strata to make it easier. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, and so we, we thought a better way to do peering would to be to, instead of have these plugins that speak to each other, um, separate, out, separate out the functions of a plugin better and say you, you have uh, something that talks to another connector and you deal with, you know, you deal with uh, what protocol are we using to communicate and we exchange ILP packets and then settlement is kind of something completely different and deal with that in a sort of separate way. And, and on the back of those motivations, this is what we got. So 
First up, we have a route manager and a routing table. So there's a standalone module now which does routing the ILP way. It's a, it's a routing table. It's a route manager that processes a variety of different events that would cause it to change the routing table. And what's interesting about this is once it was built, and credit to Matt who did, did most of this work, we realized that it actually doesn't depend on any other ILP libraries. It's not, a, it's not actually an ILP router. It's a routing module that routes based on any addressing scheme that looks like ILP. So if it's hierarchical address, we can put it in a table and we can route. Uh, and that was quite an interesting sort of realization. And that, that sort of drove some of the other thinking that we had around the connector and the, the pieces around it. So what we ended up with was this router, and I apologize, I just got into this already. Um, and, and what it does quite differently to the way we had thought about routing before is it doesn't look at amounts or expiries at all. It literally just looks at an address. So you give it an address and you say, what's the next hop? Where, where do I send this next? And it looks in a routing table, it comes back and says, this is where it goes. And one of those hops might be myself. Uh, and that's what it does. Um, what's interesting about that is if you have that isolated and, and, and stand alone, uh, it has some interesting implications for how you would configure a cluster of connectors where you might have sort of a master routing engine for all of them. And so you can you know, scale out and have connectors that do a lot of business rule processing but not routing and then have a shared routing sort of table state somewhere else. Uh, we haven't tested that thoroughly yet, but the, the theory is, is, is sound. Uh, what we have tested is we've used this component in our modular proof of concept. So we have a proof of concept where module loop systems are connected using a component that uses this router and a completely different routing uh, addressing scheme. It looks a lot like Interledger, but it, it, it's not forced to use exactly the same Interledger uh, principles or Interledger uh, formats. Go ahead. What is AS style and what is Oh, sorry. Uh, autonomous system. Sorry. So it's uh, internet uh, sort of a... The, the system's right at the heart of the, the sort of tier one uh, ISPs. And you say it doesn't look at a mouse. Does it look at some kind of metric in order to give you uh, a minimum cost route for some notion of cost? Uh, because the, the total number of routes between two endpoints is going to be explosively large. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. Does it, it doesn't look at amounts. Does it uh, look at anything to evaluate at least cost route? The answer is no. So, so the current connector implementation doesn't either. Um, and, and the reason, there's, there's a number of reasons behind that, but uh, the shortest route will most of the time be the cheapest route. And, and what we found is that our higher level protocols like Stream are a better way to evaluate the total cost of a route, um, of, of money traveling along a route. Um, maybe don't have time to get into the details of that, but I'm very happy to discuss it further and maybe, maybe um, people like Evan or Travis who worked on stream, we can get into the details of how exactly when you establish a connection through multiple hops with Interledger as the substrate, stream allows you to evaluate the, the total cost across that route and what you should be able to do is start to uh, route over different routes okay. if, if the cost doesn't suit. I, I would say there are no implementations of connectors yet that are intelligent about that, but that's certainly the theory is that's where we should be going. The next thing we did is um, we needed to turn our router into a connector. Uh, and so to do that, you need to add all the protocol rules. So we implemented each of the protocols as a sort of a standalone module, which takes a message in, applies protocol rules to it, and either spits it out the other side or rejects it. Um, and the nice thing about ILP is you, you have three message types. You have a request, a prepare message coming in, and you have a response, which is either a fulfillment or a rejection. And, and so all of those protocol modules can be implemented as, you know, effectively something that does exactly that. Takes in a prepare message, either rejects it or fulfills it or passes it on. And then the interesting thing that came from that is business rules are basically exactly the same. So if you want to apply business rules to a packet, and when we say business rules, we mean things that are not specific to the protocol, but more about the operating rules of the person who's running the connector, it's pretty much the same thing. So what you'll see in the code is they actually both uh, implement identical interfaces. And again, can be coded in isolation and can be swapped in and out. And, and you can apply, you know, you can have a rule that you apply to one peer but not to another. Uh, so it's very sort of interchangeable. It's, it's slight, for those who know the ILP connector as it is today, slightly different to that in that um, 
we don't have a single instance of these that is shared across all peers. We create one per peer and we kind of chain them together and we try and keep them very lightweight. Um, there's been comments um, around that design that it may be more memory heavy than, than existing designs, untested so far, but our thinking is from what we've seen on the network today, nobody's trying to maintain thousands of peers at a time. And if you do, you can shard out and you, there's, there's ways to get around that. We do have then a message pipeline, which effectively is just these rules chained together. And so when you configure your connector, you effectively say, these are the rules I want to apply to a peer and you know, give them an order and they get chained together. And that, that's really all the connector software does is create an instance of a router, take in a whole bunch of instances of rules you want, chain them together, and then attach them to an endpoint, which is listening for external messages. And they come in, you check where to send them out, and you send them out on another pipeline. Um, and that's, that, that's really, the, the, the logic of the connector is actually pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. This raises an interesting question in that because our router doesn't look at amounts, where do we actually do FX? Um, and the way we've chosen to implement this, and there's been a lot of discussion, and uh, credit to David and to Evan and other people who are doing connector implementations, we've really had a lot of good back and forth debates about how to do this. This is our approach, um, and, and we think it's, you know, the theory behind it is sound, but, you know, interested to hear what you say. So what we do is implement FX as rules. So an amount comes in, you normalize it to some sort of uh, currency that is native to the, the connector itself, and then you apply other business rules, then you may need to apply a conversion on the outgoing leg as well. That sounds kind of expensive, it sounds like inefficient, but the reality is most of the time you don't actually need to normalize in and out. In fact, the network today is all XRP, pr pretty much, so you wouldn't even have FX rules. You would only have rules to apply a fee maybe. So what you end up with is, on the odd case that your connector has multiple connections in more than one currency, you may need to normalize into a currency and out again, but most of the time you'll have a predominant currency that most of your connections are in, and you'll only have to apply FX to connections that are not in that currency. So as I say, it's, it's often not required at all. What's quite nice about this is that your normalized amounts are really easy to reason about. So if you apply your FX early on in the pipeline, everything inside that is in the same currency. So if you're applying fees or you're applying some sort of business logic based on amounts, you can know that the amount is always in the same currency. And so you don't have to think about, well, this peers in, this guy I'm pairing with is in Bitcoin and this one's in Ethereum. And so, you know, when I'm calculating a throughput limit or something, for him, I'm calculating it based on Bitcoin, but for him, I'm calculating based on Ethereum. It's always normalized. So it's just a, a lot easier to manage that configuration and think about it. Um, What's also quite nice is your rates and fees can be applied differently. So you might have one FX rule that you're applying for a peer that's going off and fetching rates dynamically every time a packet comes in or something. Whereas you might also have static rates that are being pushed down to the rule. And you might also mix that up. So on some peers, uh, your source of your rates might be from, let's say, a because it's fiat to fiat, it might be um, from a more traditional uh, source of FX rates, but in crypto you might be pulling your rates from, let's say, CoinCap, somewhere, somewhere different. You don't need to now aggregate all of those before you push that into the connector. The final kind of new feature or new thing that we, we implemented in Rafiki, which is quite different to what exists today, is the concept of an endpoint. Um, and so endpoints effectively replace plugins today, or at least a portion of plugins. So as I said, we took the plugin concept and said, well, Actually, what we really care about is how do I connect to somebody over some connection and send and receive ILP packets? And that's what endpoints do. Endpoints are that sort of abstraction of I want to send and receive ILP packets. That's, that's all I care about. Um, and we also then think about the idea of separating the concept of a server from a socket or a connection. So you don't have sort of an endpoint that runs in server mode. You, you run an HTTP server if you're going to accept connections, and then each connection gets wrapped around this endpoint abstraction. And so for everything inside the endpoint, it doesn't matter how the packet got there. Whether it came over HTTP, whether it came over um, WebSockets, it really doesn't matter. And the simplicity of implementing an endpoint is such that we will probably ship all of the obvious 
um, transports just with the connector. You don't really need a plug-in for BTP, a plug-in for you know, HTTP and so on. You, you might as well just ship them because there's no settlement logic. The complexity of plugins today is mostly in the settlement. Mm -hmm. And then finally we have this concept of the app. So what the app does, uh, and this is really just mostly a logical abstraction. The, the connector is the, is the protocols and the router. And then the app basically puts that all together. So it, it's, the app takes all of the tools that Rafiki has and many of these are existing code that we've taken from the previous connector and repurposed slightly and, and basically puts it all together. So there you would have things like you know, cross-cutting services like stats or you know, a token bucket for measuring things like throughput or whatever the case may be. So, so you might need stateful stuff or you may, have, uh, you may want to externalize this, some of this stuff into a centralized place so that you can drop connectors down by the hundreds instantiate them, they'd be completely stateful, and anything that needs state exists outside. Our current um, implementation just starts as a shell. When it starts up, it's dumb. It, it, I think, doesn't even, it knows its own ILP address, but that's also something we'd, we'd like to change. And, and the idea is that we, we coded this thinking first about how you would deploy it in sort of a cloud environment where you might you know, you would want to just be spinning these things up really quickly and then have a separate control plane or, or separate system that is, after it spins up, says, well, this is who you are and this is how you fit into this ecosystem. And so, you know, because you can adjust configuration on the fly, you'd be able to, you know, push that down to the Rafiki pods or instances or however, the, however it's working. And finally, it does no settlement. So all of that complexity that sits in the ILP plugin actually exists outside of the connector in, in our implementation. Um, and so then the question is, how does this connector work? <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of detail here, but um, connector and settlement engine um, exist as separate ideas or separate things. Uh, the way we've implemented today is one example of how it could be done. We think there's a lot of permutations of how you might do this, but the idea being your connector is focused on um, passing ILP packets back and forward. And what you may implement, and this is entirely up to the operator, is a rule in there that says, check a balance somewhere before you forward this packet on. And then something else, an entirely different system, is adjusting the balances in that balanced repository, that storage of balance state, and that's where settlement happens. So it would be watching those balances and seeing if they cross some sort of a threshold, decide to do settlement, uh, if that's successful, adjust the balance, etc. So completely separating the concepts of settlement and you know, being a connector. In terms of next steps, I started to write one or two things here, but they're already to-dos on the GitHub repo, so that wouldn't have been worth it. Um, from our perspective, we want to hear what people want to do with this and, and you know, either now or forum mailing list, uh, chat to any of us afterwards. Um, we really like to hear sort of how you want to proceed with it. And, and one, of the, one of the goals in our design was to make it easy for people to contribute. And I think one of the benefits of the modularity is you could say, well, I really want to build a different or better balance rule or FX mechanism. And it's quite easy to do that in isolation and, and we can just you know, you can just pull it into the project and when somebody starts up an instance of Rafiki, they choose to use that one or not. It's, it's entirely up to them. We wrote a blog post um, sort of introducing it a few weeks ago. Uh, there's a lot more detail in there if you want to understand more. And then, yeah, I want to say thanks to Matt and Don who are the, the main drivers behind there. Um, there's a lot of debate about who is Timon and who is Pumba, but if you do want to know more about Rafiki, Tomorrow and Pumba are around to answer your questions. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> questions? So, in reading the interledger papers, uh, there's a lot of focus on uh, this issue of um, uh, when you get the receipt, that means the pay has been paid, mm -hmm. uh, you pay the downstream connector, <coughs> and then you pass the receipt upstream in order to get paid. Uh, I didn't understand from this presentation where that functionality ended up. Right, so the question is where does the functionality for passing the receipt back and forward? So, and, and also deciding to take the risk 
of paying before you've been paid. I mean, there's a risk right. taken on. Right. Deciding who, who, who's taking on the, the credit risk. Yeah. Right. So this doesn't answer those questions. This is software. It enables quite a lot of flexibility. So the, the let me say, the exchanging of the uh, request and then the receipt, that's ILP packets. So that's what we would, you know, in, in this, um, this is pretty, I apologize, pretty deep dive for anyone who hasn't looked at existing software. Um, th there's probably a lot of jargon in there and I apologize for that. But what this software does is exchange those packets with another connector. So that's, that's its core function. And that is the, the prepare packet is the, you know, the, the uh, request to send the payment. And the router is the det determines where to forward that on, who's the next hop. So that's all done in Rafiki. And then what it's doing is it's focused purely on getting those packets back and forward. But what you can implement is a, what I call a, a business rule that sits on that pipeline and says, um, you know, check the balance of the entity who sent you the packet and determine whether you actually forward it on or not. So you might reject it or, or not. And then the business rules that you would apply to decide, do I you know, accept packets from that person of, and forward them on or do I reject them, is based on the business relationship. So it's, that's not a technical decision, but the technology allows to, you to apply it. So, yeah. Stefan. The, the previous questioner uh, asked the reference specifically the intelligent paper. So I wonder if there's uh, basic stuff implemented like um, does it check expiries, does it check fulfillments, and so does it guarantee the semantics of the hub? Okay, yeah. So, so the question was does it implement basic stuff that exists in, in you know, the reference implementation? The answer there is yes. We, we took what are called middlewares in the existing implementation, and those are all ported over as rules. Um, where this is maybe slightly different is I think it's quite a lot easier to decide if you actually want to apply the rules or not. Then we also separated, as I said, the rules into business rules and protocol rules. So kind of a, by default, a non-optional is the protocol rules. You, you get those by default. So you, ILDCP, ILP, so check expiry, check fulfillment, those things, I would consider those ILP protocol rules. When you spin up an instance of connector, those are on the pipeline already at the end, just before the router. But then what you can decide is, okay, well, do I, what FX and what sort of throughput rim, limiting and et cetera do I apply before the protocol rules? Is, is there a slide, one of your modularity slides of the different pieces where you can essentially give that explanation with point at the different pieces as you do that? The best is probably the picture that's on the blog post, which unfortunately, I, this is kind of the top half of it. But <laughs> it's, it's got enough of it that you can see. So you would have a packet coming in here into an endpoint. So for, as an example, an HDTV endpoint. And then each of those is a little component that's evaluate, applying a rule to that packet. So the first one is checking throughput. Second one is rate limiting. The third is you know, checking the balance of that. So each of those pipelines, think of that as a pipeline dedicated to an individual entity that you connected to a peer. And then each of the protocol processes over there is applying protocol stuff. So ILDCP would be, you know, if that packet comes in and it's requesting configuration, that, that protocol processor would actually turn the packet around and respond. It wouldn't go all the way through to the router. Thank you. That answers my question. Any others? Yes. So there is this routing table in here. Uh, I I don't know if I missed it, but how do you fill this routing table? I, I haven't gone into a lot of detail, and I apologize on that. So that's um, the routing, sorry, repeat the question. Uh, how does the routing table get populated? A number of ways. So the routing table is relatively straightforward. There's actually two tables in there, and, and Matt, feel free to keep me honest here. There's a table you use for routing, and there's a table you use to determine what routes you broadcast to everyone else, uh, a, f a forwarding table. And the way those change are a number of ways. Configuration could be one of the things that changes them. So as you start up, you add a new peer, and you therefore add an entry in the routing table that tells you how to route to them. So you know their address, you put it in your routing table, and you say, well, anything addressed to that guy, I now start routing to him. So configuration would be one. Another might be the routing protocol itself. So CCP, the connector to connector protocol, is a protocol for exchanging route information. Um, and that's probably, I would say that's, in fact, not probably, that's definitely the biggest uh, ramp up in terms of 
becoming an interledger expert is understanding how that works. I think there's a handful of people, and I don't count myself as one of them, that understands that in detail. But that's the that's the BGP of, of interledger. That's you know how do nodes communicate with each other to explain who they can route to and what the network looks like. Uh, and that's the other way that that routing table can change. So the the route manager is processing all of these different events that could affect the routing table and making the changes. And the reason we did that is we wanted the routing table to be extremely efficient at doing one thing. It has a table and it answers queries really quickly about given this address, where should I route it? And the, the idea being that ultimately we would hope that gets re-implemented in something a little bit more efficient, for example, than JavaScript. But you could still use it within this um, application. And there are some policies as well that you apply to um, there, there is policies. So currently there's a variety of different ways you would weight um, routes. Uh, I think the way we've done it is slightly different to how it's implemented in the reference implementation with the same effect. So we apply the same policies, um, but what we do is we only push in a weighting as opposed to pushing in all the different dimensions that are used. Um, I don't, yeah. yeah. Maybe I can just add, so like, Matt, what you're I'm gonna have to come over here and talk in the mic. I mean, the routing's pretty complicated because it's quite difficult to understand from the current implementation. Um, so much so that Tiga actually has tried to document it and it's been like quite a discussion. I couldn't uh, find any documentation. There, there is under the RFCs, there's like a, blow, uh, there's a pull request to actually document it, but there's no formal documentation. Because it hasn't been finished. Because it hasn't <laughs> been finished, yes. Um, so the idea is like, the current connector implementation sees the ILP is quite sort of integrated into the concept of routing. So like it, it needs to know the concept of a relation and all these things. And like when we pulled that out for module loop, it didn't make sense that you have the concept of these relations in the module loop setup. So we sort of abstracted a little bit more how IP do it, they use this concept of weightings. And basically you can apply arbitrary weightings and you just then choose how to, the, the higher weighting route becomes your root master. So like if I had a root update coming in for an address saying it's a weighting of 400 and then you had a new one coming in that had a weighting of 600, that root would now be the root you would use as your primary root instead of the 400. And likewise, if that root then became invalidated, you would drop back down to the 400 weighting because that would be your best root to root for that address. I mean, it's, a, it's pretty much exactly like how IP does it. It's like, it, it's identical. There's, there's probably, it's probably <coughs> worth, if people are interested, having a little sideline session about routing. I mean, I cool. So, so if that's something people want to dig into in more detail, I know Stefan's got lots of ideas about things we could still add to the routing protocols. Um, one of the big issues with I routing in IP, for example, is the, the fact that it's not very secure. And so we've made some efforts to make ours more secure. Um, and you know, discussion around how we do that, how that works. Um, I know Stefan's given a lot of thought, and you know, we'd love to add that to the implementations as well. So, yeah, I'll I'll chat with Vanessa. Maybe we maybe that's something we put on the agenda for tomorrow. Kind of a a sideline on on routing. Any other questions on Rafiki? Okay, thanks very much.